All right, now let's get to the big one that you worked <laughs> on at MGM, uh, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Oh, yeah. And again, that, uh, to me, you know, when, when you're working on, on, on projects, you go from one project to the next one, and you never say, God, this is going to be a classic. And, and it's amazing how some just stand out uh, uh, above all the other ones that, you know, pe that people remember. And, and the Grinch is one of those that just kind of just pops out and it, it become a classic. And, and again, it's the combination of uh, three or four things. You know, it was a, a, a great story, Dr. Seuss. It was a, the, the, the great character, the Grinch, you know, and, and Chuck, the timing. And the, it was the music. There was the voice, the, the voice of Boris Karloff. I mean, I can't imagine anybody else doing that. And the music, you know, the, the music just, uh, so it's a combination of things. And with it, when all those co uh, different elements click, I mean, it, it just grabs you. And, you know, the, the design, those Maurice Noble backgrounds were just, uh, you know, beautiful. And, uh, and it, it's become a classic and er everybody, you know, it's one of their favorites, and and you, and you cannot think of Christmas without thinking of the Grinch, and and again, it's a, it's a it's a simple story, but this guy who, you know, antisocial and whatever else, you know, just hates everybody and everything, who just turns around all of a sudden sees the good things and becomes a, and it's just a simple story, but again, it's how it's told, and uh, and and how you develop those characters and the timing and the action, I mean. And, and, and again, like I said earlier, the, the uh, Chuck knew his animators, and he gave uh, the, the scenes to Ken that had all that personality and, and, and action. There because he, Ken had this way of working where he, he's drawing, but it looks like he's just writing a letter. You know, it's just kind of just makes his drawings kind of a little bit of an just kind of where you know I have to struggle. I said, you know, and then to go back, <laughs> but uh, it, it, it just like it's a natural thing of just making a drawing. And, and again, Benny uh, also had this a sense of uh, of uh, character, of personality, of capturing certain uh, elements of, uh, of uh, in the soundtrack to bring out visually. And uh, so all those uh, great examples for me, because I'm working with these guys, you know. And, Picking up little bits and pieces from them, and uh, so so it it it, it, uh, it it was just a terrific experience, you know. And then later that uh, we also did another Dr. Seuss things, uh, Cat, and not the Cat in the Hat, but the Horton Hears a Who, uh, there with Chuck. And later I worked on Cat in the Hat with uh, Fritz Freeling uh, after uh, MGM closed up. How well known was the the book by Dr. Seuss at that time? Oh, it was very well known. Oh yeah, it was. Uh, you know, uh, Doctor Seuss's books have been you know, popular like from day one, I think, <laughs> and uh, so he had a huge following. And and again, uh, again, you know, you, you look at the drawings that Doctor Seuss made and uh, and Chuck Jones' drawings, uh, and he he adapted the character, you know, and uh, he really put personality in it because I look at his drawings that Chuck would give us to to animate his poses, and. I mean, it was there. He had captured that, the essence of the, of the character. And, and, and whatever the mood was, you know, whether he's surprised or whether he's angry and kind of thing, he, he, he captured it. And I remember he'd come out of, uh, of his office, you know, he makes uh, one drawing that was especially funny to him. And he'd come out and say, look at this, I got this. You know, so I mean, we'd all laugh. And so, so then the, the challenge then was to capture that in motion, in movement, in, in the character, and uh, so, but that that's uh, that was a great challenge. <laughs> How involved was Dr. Seuss or Ted Geisel uh, involved in the production? Uh, he would come. Uh, he dealt directly with uh, with Chuck, and uh, he, he wasn't that involved. I, I remember seeing there in the. I mean, he was involved in the, in the story, in the storyboarding. But once we got in production. Uh, uh, I, I remember seeing him there in the studio, maybe you know, three or four times during the production, maybe five times. You know, he'd come in and you know, talk to the guys and, and look around, see what we're doing, and, uh, and then he and Chuck would talk. And, <laughs> but uh, it, it was 
Chuck and uh, and Ted, they had the, they're the ones that had the, the relationship. Uh, did he ever give you any input into your drawings when he would come by? No, no, no. no I, don't, I don't think he ever uh, did that to anybody. Uh, I think he, if he had any problems, he would talk to Chuck about it, and uh, Chuck would uh, pass that information to us. But uh, I think he was pretty pretty happy with because uh, uh, I don't remember hearing any anything. Uh, you know, uh, like Dr. Ted Geisel doesn't like this or he doesn't like that. Uh, I think he was pretty, pretty pleased. What yeah. kinds of scenes did you animate? Uh, I did a lot of the Cindy Lou Who. I did uh, some of the scenes where uh, they're in the, having the, the feast. There's one scene where little guys are walking out uh, with, with a tray and lifts the thing, and then another little guy walks out with a tray. And little guy. I, I, I animated that scene. Uh, the Cindy Lou Who was where you know, it's, uh, uh, where the Grinch comes to her and, and he shoes her off and says, you know, I come to take this and I'll bring it right back, you know, that. Uh, uh, so th this kind of scattered throughout, uh, and up on the top of Mount Crumpet when the Christmas tree was being put up, I did some of that. This, I kind of spotted around them about then. Now, how did you uh, design or animate these? very unrealistic characters with realistic movements and structures. Well, but see, that's what we do on, on anything, you know, uh, on, a, on, any, on any project. Th there's model sheets, and so you just, uh, it's your, your problem is to, uh, your challenge is to bring them to life. And, and again, like I say, we, we, we have uh, pencil tests, and the pencil test, you can see if, if it's working. And so if it's not working, uh, then you change it. In those days, uh, we used to, all the animation was done here in town. So every, every, the animator, every studio had animators working on the staff. And, and now you, there, there are no animators, unless it's on theatrical uh, features. There, the, there's no animators working on, on television series. There's uh, storyboard guys and, and uh, directors and timers, but uh, no animators. It's all done in the Far East. But uh, in those days, uh, every studio had their, uh, their team of animators. And uh, so uh, the animators, you know, did, they adapted. You know, they were hired for their ability to adapt in whatever studio they were working in. What kinds of special effects were used? Or were there any? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, uh, you always use special effects, you know, whether it's water or snow or whatever. So again, uh, depending on, on the style, uh, of the of the picture that you make it you make it fit in and, and the idea is just to because uh, 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 Benny Washam had a, uh, this theory that effects have character also it's not just something you do you know that you got to put character into the effects so so I kind of picked that up from him that to give the effects a little bit more uh, uh, distinctiveness to it than just making things move you know. So, Talk about the two voice performers from The Grinch, Boris Karloff and June and Foray. Foray. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, again, uh, the June Foray was the voice of Cindy Lou Who, and, uh, and uh, again, um, Boris Karloff was a narrator and uh, and and the voice of The Grinch. <laughs> but uh, uh, again, to me, Boris Karloff was inspired casting. Because uh, it, 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 any anybody else doing that, it just would not have had the same kind of a feel. Because he he was a, an actor, you know, a real actor from the old school uh, stage, and he brought a lot of subtleties to the character. He brought a lot of uh, uh, n n things that n meaty things that you could do with the character that uh, that uh, I enjoyed. So, but to me, that that's in inspired. Uh, casting. Did you interact with them much? No, no. Because what happens is that uh, they do the soundtrack first, and that's off in some recording studio, and then then uh, you get the, the soundtrack, and then you animate to that. And so, uh, no, we didn't uh, interact with them at all. And if there's any pickup lines, you know, later on, you know, Chuck would go off somewhere and, and record those lines. But uh, but there was n n nothing where they would come to the studio and uh, and say, "What are you doing to my character?" <laughs> Talk about the songs by Albert Hag. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. How important do you think they were? Well, true. I mean, uh, I mean, that was part of the combination. You know, you're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. I mean, I mean, that stays with you. I mean, those songs uh, stay with you. And uh, and if uh, uh, so, it, it, it's it's that combination that clicks. And uh, and again, that's one show that had it. And, and, but again, I mean, it was critical. How long did it take to produce The Grinch? It's probably around six months. TV specials usually take about six months to animate. Was, it a, days. was yeah. it a success right away? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah right away. Yeah, it was, uh, it was uh, you know, it got, kept getting repeated every, every year, you know, by CBS first. And then, then it was, uh, became part of, uh, uh, it was part, it belonged to MGM. And so when Ted Turner bought MGM, it became part of his library. Now, you also mentioned working on another Dr. Seuss property, Horton Hears a Who. Yeah. yeah. Um, what stands out from, uh, in your memory from working on that project? Well, uh, again, uh, it, all of a sudden, you're, you know, you're doing an elephant. An elephant walks a certain way, and then there were some uh, kangaroos in there. And, and so you know, how do they move? They hop. You know, so how, how do you make them move? Then, then there's another little world and, and, and who's, you know, but they're way off in little, uh, in a different little world. So, so, so uh, again, uh, those worlds that Dr. Seuss created, I mean, they were, they were you know, magical. And, and just bringing them to life and, and making them entertaining, you know, was a challenge. That, that, that's what I enjoyed, you know, bring, making these characters move. And uh, so. When did you leave MGM? Uh, the studio closed. Uh, in 1969, about uh, toward the end of 69, and, uh, and then so everybody kind of split up, and uh, then from there I went to work with, uh, at UPA, working on a, a Mr. Magoo special, Uncle, Uncle Sam Magoo, uh, with uh, that uh, Abe Levito uh, had, uh, w was directing. And, and see, Abe Levito had been one of Chuck's animators back at the Warner Brothers, and, uh, and Abe was the director on uh, the Phantom Tollbooth. So that's where I got to know him. And, and Abe was just a terrific guy. I mean, he, he was uh, a real gentle giant. I mean, he was a uh, big, tall guy, but such a wonderful person. I mean, he was really uh, one of the nice guys and, and very, very talented, you know, very, very talented. So uh, when, uh, and he had worked at UPA before, so when uh, uh, it, uh, MGM closed, you know, he went over to UPA and uh, and uh, to direct that one, that one special. What kind of a production company was UPA? What sort of projects had they done? Oh, they uh, they were one of the uh, big studios in uh, back in, uh, in like in the late '40s and '50s. Uh, they were very avant-garde. They did Mr. Magoo. They did Gerald McBoing Boing. They were the anti-Disney, because Disney was this you know, full animation, kind of cute characters and stuff, where UPA was kind of very uh, in the design, in uh, kind of the, how, how you tell a story that's a little bit offbeat, in the character, not the full animation, but you know, they, they, they had a, a, a unique style and they had some terrific, a terrific talent there. And, uh, but it, it was a different style of animation. Describe the Mr. Magoo character. Yeah, I, uh, again, uh, he, he's uh, nearsighted. And uh, again, again he, there had been a lot of Mr. Magoo done uh, by the time I got there. So his character had been pretty well developed. So the idea was to stay within those guidelines of how how to move him and how to make him act, how, how to react. And so, again, it's, uh, it was working with a classic character. And, uh, and he is a classic character to this day. And Who was so, he modeled after? Uh, there's, a, there's an artist called uh, Leo, uh, Leo Salkin that, I guess he worked at UPA at the time, and uh, he, he had a bald head and kind of like squinty eyes. and. But he, he, was a, he was a great uh, designer, animator. He was a really good, good guy. And, uh, but, 
you'd, you'd see Leo, you'd see Mr. Magoo. <laughs> and uh, again, you know, it's a guy's having fun. Now, didn't you also work at Jay Ward Productions uh, during uh, this era? It, yeah, uh, I, uh, it was uh, like in the 60s, and I was, when I was freelancing, I worked on uh, Georgia the Jungle and uh, some of the main titles on, on Georgia the Jungle and some of the episodes. But uh, that was, uh, again, you know, like Jay had come from uh, that uh, San Francisco uh, doing uh, Crusader Rabbit, along with Alex Anderson and Bob Mills and John Sperry, those guys. And uh, he, some of the, uh, John Sperry came uh, to L.A. and uh, worked at Disney's, and later he worked for me directing uh, some uh, Garfields. Bob Mills stayed up there in uh, the Bay Area. Uh, Alex Anderson worked in the advertising agencies, but uh, Jay came down here and, you know, he did uh, Rocky Bullwinkle and uh, went on to greater success. How did the Jay Ward style of animation differ from others? Uh, again, uh, it's, it's a limited animation. And uh, a lot of the early J. Ward stuff was done in Mexico. They opened up a studio in Mexico City and sent uh, some directors over there to kind of uh, oversee it, like uh, George Singer and uh, guys like that. And uh, he, uh, uh, but again, it, it's very simple animation. And, and, and the animation sometimes uh, was somewhat erratic but it didn't matter because it had terrific uh, uh, stories and, and terrific voices where you get caught up in the character. And, and see, that, that's the secret. The technique is not the important thing. It's the uh, characters and the stories. And, uh, and, and Jay nailed that. You, know, it's, uh, the, you don't need all that fancy animation, the full animation, to really say that uh, it's going to be a, a, a great uh, series. It, it's the character. I mean, you, you remember those characters and the, how, how silly the, the stories were and, uh, and, and the timing. And, and, and Ju Foray, again, was the voice of Natasha in that. And, and they had the, so, like, great voices and, and, and great storytellers. How well did you know Jay? Uh, I, not too well, you know, because uh, when I worked there, I, uh, I was just one of the animators. And, uh, in fact, I, I was freelancing, so you know, I, I was working at home, and I just delivered my stuff in and pick up some more work from the directors. So I really never got to know him until, until afterwards when uh, um, I, I, you know, I already had my studio, and, and I approached him about uh, doing some more uh, Rocky and Bullwinkles. But uh, he says, nah, he says, I already did some, and I don't think that any more should be made. You know? So he was very nice. Very nice about it, but uh, I, and I can understand uh, his uh, his reaction. Uh, now later, you worked for De Patty Freeling Productions. Yes. Uh, what sort of uh, projects did you work on there, and how did that come uh, about? Well, um, I worked with uh, uh, De Patty Freeling. Uh, no, uh, De Patty Freeling was uh, uh, Chris Freeling, who had been one of the big uh, Warner Brothers directors, along with Chuck Jones, and. Uh, Tex Avery and uh, Bob McKimson. Uh, and, uh, and so when Warner Brothers broke up, he partnered with uh, Dave DePatty, who, uh, uh, and they started DePatty Freeling. And, and so um, when Warner Brothers broke up, I, I was working at, uh, not Warner, uh, when MGM closed up, and after I, I finished that uh, job, Mr. Magoo, then they got a Dr. Seuss uh, special to, um, to animate, so then they hired some of the animators that had worked on uh, on uh, Horton and uh, yeah, Horton Here's a Who and, and the Grinch, and so I was one of them that went to work over there. And so I, I, I not only worked on uh, on uh, the Cat in the Hat, but I also worked on like uh, 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 what was Mr. Um, uh, Talk to the Animals. Um, uh, oh, there I go again. Doctor Doolittle. <laughs> Doctor Doolittle. Yeah. I worked on Dr. Gula. I worked on a little bit on the Pink Panther. And they had some other characters that, uh, that are not that well known now. So, but I was there for uh, almost a year. What sort of animation style did they use? Again, uh, they used uh, uh, 
some of the, because uh, the core group that uh, Briz had, he brought with him from Warner Brothers, his, his unit uh, from Warner Brothers, uh, he kept it. So uh, a lot of it, uh, even the writers were guys that had worked with Frizz. And uh, so the, the, there was a, a lot of that Warner Brothers uh, sense to the animation, to the style, to the movement, to the storytelling. And uh, so uh, uh, the, even the design of the characters was very, very uh, much so. That, so that, that was a big Warner Brothers influence to, uh, to his, uh, uh, to his uh, work. Uh, the Dr. Doolittle uh, was kind of a little bit more straight on because it was a human character and it was a, 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 a different kind of world. But uh, but anyway, that's uh, again I got to work with some great animators like uh, like Holly Pratt, you know, one of the great designers there at Warner Brothers, and, uh, and Manny Perez and uh, guys like that. Uh, does anything stand out for you from working on the Pink Panther? No, no, just okay. just another. You know, in those days, you know, you uh, you'd go to a director. You know, what do you got? You know, well, you know, I don't have anything. Why don't you go talk to this other director? Then he'd give you some work. So you'd go do it. So I mean, again, uh, in retrospect, it, uh, you'd look at me and say, "Oh yeah, I worked on that. Wow, you know." But when you're there, you just say, "Oh, you know, I'm looking for work." You know, you have anything? Yes. Yeah, so, so you do it. <laughs> it's uh, so nothing really stands out because. It, it, Again, uh, the Pink Panther was uh, very unique to to, uh, uh, to Patty Freeling because uh, I, th I think the character was designed by Holly Pratt, and uh, uh, and so again, you know, it was based on the main titles of the movie, and so then they, they did the series, and again, uh, another classic character, you know, and uh, who again um, you don't see too much of it right now, no, but again, uh, I think has a lot of potential for. For, for, for new new, uh, new episodes. And did working on the Cat in the Hat, did that process differ any from working on the Sioux mm. specials with MGM? Yeah, uh, again, the, uh, the the difference is that uh, uh, different directors. The Cat in the Hat uh, was directed by Holly Pratt, mainly, and, uh, and, and then there were a couple of other guys that had been with uh, Frizz before that he, he it, so I don't, Frizz didn't do any actual direction on it, but uh, uh, so every, everybody has their own style of doing things, and, and Holly uh, uh, had a, he, he was a terrific guy, I mean, he was a, a great artist, and in time, he learned a lot from Frizz, you know, uh, in, in the little subtleties of, of a character, and uh, uh, so, uh, but again, it, it, it's a different style. You know, it's more to the Dr. Seuss look rather than, uh, you know, going to how Chuck you know, brought out his kind of uh, more exaggerated movement and stuff. That, uh, and, and, uh, and, but again, to me, it worked very well because, uh, because the characters are strong and the story was strong. And, uh, but it, it was, it was, a, it was a, a great project. Well, now, in 1972, you joined mm -hmm. up with Bill Melendez. Yep. How did that come about? Well, um, I had been doing some freelance work for Bill, uh, on, on doing some freelance animation uh, on some of the uh, specials that he had been doing. And uh, so when the job ran out, I did Patty Freely. Then I called him up. I said, you know, is there anything? He said, yeah, come on over. And so then... Uh, that's when he hired me uh, full time as an animator, and uh, so uh, I, I wor wor working on a, I think it was Snoopy Come Home, the, the feature, and uh, then he started doing uh, uh, Charlie Brown uh, Thanksgiving, and so uh, halfway through that, he he just got tied up on something else. He says, Phil, he says, could you finish directing? Uh, the rest of this uh, special, and uh, sure, <laughs> I mean to direct. I mean, I, I always wanted to direct, but I'd never uh, had been given the opportunity, and so so I just went ahead and did it, just following you know, because he had he, again he had his own way of working, and he kind of ran through his you know, working on bar sheets and timing things out a certain way and stuff. So you know, uh, I just I just followed uh, the way he had uh, the system he had set up. And, and sure enough, you know, we, we did it, came out, and fine. So after that, you know, I, I directed the next uh, 14 uh, specials, uh, Charlie Brown specials that Bill did. 
Was he not a co-director at all? What, what was his well, involvement he, then? He was busy on other projects, you know, because uh, they had other things. And, uh, but, he, but he would be involved in uh, dealing with Sparky, with Schultz. He, he would be uh, doing the storyboard and developing that, uh, doing the recording sessions and, uh, uh, and, and a lot of it, because that required a lot of time. And so the day-to-day -day doing, the timing, the, you know, dealing with the animators and all, all of the other stuff, uh, you know, I just took that off of his back, and uh, where he had more time to de uh, deal with uh, the, the run the business and the, the new new projects and uh, the new specials and things like that. Describe Bill Melendez. Uh, he he is uh, again one of my heroes. He's uh, uh, he along with Chuck and uh, some of the other guys. Uh, you know, because uh, being uh, uh, a Mexican. Uh, he, you know, he was one of my heroes because, uh, as an example, something to reach for, to attain, because he was actually born in Mexico, and I was born here. But again, uh, the the ethnic thing was very strong, as a, as, a, as an example. So to actually have worked with him, and uh, and 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 been part of his studio, and contributed. To, I mean, to me, to me, just uh, one of the big highlights in my uh, in my career. But uh, he's uh, a, a very, very talented guy. He, he's, his background, he had worked with Warren Brothers and, uh, and a lot of the shorts, and then he'd worked in commercials at uh, Playhouse Pictures. And, uh, and, and so he, he, and he, he can really draw. I mean, he's got this great style of drawing and does some great caricatures of himself. And, uh, but again, you know, he's got this great big mustache. And, <laughs> and uh, he's just a, 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 a great guy. Uh, and so, like I said earlier, that when I set out to uh, start my own studio, I patterned it after um, after his studio and, and after Chuck Jones' studio, because uh, those to me were the most fun, where I enjoyed not only uh, creatively but also dealing uh, with, with the people and the artists and that. So, and uh, and it seemed to have worked out for me because you, you have to make a. a Place that's artist friendly, where they can feel they can uh, create uh, to their uh, best efforts. Before you joined uh, his company, had you mm -hmm. seen any of the previous Peanut specials? Oh yeah, oh absolutely. What I did mean, you think the, of them? The, the, the first one was uh, that Christmas special, and uh, again, I mean that made a big hit right off the bat because again, these little characters, uh, see the, the these Peanuts characters, I don't think were meant to, were drawn to be animated <laughs> because uh, they're, they're very flat. The only one that can, is animatable is like Snoopy because you can actually turn him around. The other characters are, you know, very, either look this way or look you know, from the front or three quarters but uh, or, or sideways. But again, there's some poses where they don't look that good. So you have to uh, design them where you, you maximize uh, their strength, you know, the way the, uh, Sparky drew them. And uh, 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 and again, it, it, it's uh, it's it's a challenge, and they have little feet, you know, they, they, and to they don't have the feet where they actually do very uh, elaborate walks, you know, just little. And, and so to bring those elements in, as, part, as I, mean, I was just uh, enthralled at the way how Bill uh, solved those problems, and how he. Uh, uh, and, and then the style of the backgrounds, you know, they had a, a, a nice watercolory, rich look to them, and uh, they, uh, and, and then his timing, you know, how, how he brings out the best in his storytelling, and and then of course uh, Vince Guaraldi's music, you know, was uh, very, very distinctive. Let's stop right there to change okay. shapes. <laughs>